Hello, my name is Colin McLeod uh, and I'm a researcher working at the University of Aberdeen. I've been involved with marine life on an official basis for about the last five or six years, uh, but I've got um, connections with marine life going back as far as the really the late 1990s, uh, back when it was still a uh, Biscay Dolphin Research Project. What I'm going to talk about today is conservation uses of marine life data and just show you some of the ways that we make use of the data that are collected by marine life. Uh, and really this schematic gives it an overview of things. We take the data that's um, recorded during surveys and we use it to look at things like trends over time in specific areas or indeed the distribution of species over much larger areas and how that changes over time. And we use this information to provide advice to government, assessment of species status and for investigating how, how human activities affect cetaceans and other marine life. And I'm going to talk about three uses of marine life data today, coming from three uh, different projects that I've been involved in. The first is investigating the occurrence of big twelves in the Bay of Biscay. This is a very much a project um, being run by marine life and using marine life data alone. The second project is looking at the change of occurrence of common and white big dolphin around the UK and Ireland. This is an example of marine life working with the Atlantic Re Research Coalition partners that it's developed over the last um, four or five years to be able to provide pitch supports going on across much wider areas than any group could on its own. And finally, I'm going to look at the work that we've been doing at the University of Aberdeen along with marine life and working with marine life's data to investigate the effects of climate change on cetaceans in northwest Europe. So we start off with the big twelves. The big twelves are the least well-known family of large mammals on the planet. We know more about some animals that became extinct thousands of millions of years ago than we do about some living big twelves. For example, we know more about the woolly mammoth, been extinct for about 10,000 years, or even the Tyrannosaurus rex, that's been extinct for 65 million years, than we do about this guy, the spade-toothed big twelve. It's only known from three skulls collected over the last 150 years, and we've got no idea what this species actually looks like beyond the picture that you see here. So really, there's very little known about big twelves and any information that we can gather about them will help us be able to conserve them and prevent them from being affected by a number of things such as climate change, ingestion of plastic bags and also the effects of, of noise in the environment. As part of its ferry surveys, marine life has collected an unprecedented amount of data on big twelve occurrence in the Bay of Biscay. This allows us to look at aspects of the their ecology that we could not otherwise study. Working with a PhD student, Jackie Smith from uh, the University of Southampton, we have been using the data collected by marine life to look at the spatial and temporal distribution of B12 species. And this in turn provides important information for conservation, as we can only conserve animals if we know where they occur. This is the species, the main species I'm going to talk about today, Cuvier's B12, and it's primarily been using the data collected from the Pride of Bilbao as it goes from Portsmouth here in southern England across the, through the shallow waters of the English Channel down across the northern shelf edge over the abyssal areas, the deep areas of the Bay of Biscay through the southern canyons and up the southern um, shelf edge and into Bilbao in southern Spain, sorry, in northern Spain. And the first thing that I'm going to show you that we've learned from this is that there's quite clear seasonal movements uh, in Cuvier's beak twelves are changing the way they use the Bay of Biscay. If we look at the left hand map here which indicates spring we can see that the, the sightings are spread throughout the Bay of Biscay, the deep waters of the Bay of Biscay occurring in both the southern canyons and also along the northern shelf edges. However in autumn we get a very different picture. The distribution is very much concentrated just down in the southern canyons. This is really the first time that we've got anyone to get any concrete evidence for seasonal movements um, of beak twelves in terms of where they occur and where they don't. This is really quite critical for understanding um, how human activities are going to affect them, how we can mitigate the, these by determining what can happen when. The second thing that we've been doing with the beak twelve data is using the, the relationship between where animals are seen and where they're, they're not seen to predict um, the habitats they like to use and th where they'll occur throughout the Bay of Biscay. And we do this by relating the, the occurrence of, of 
where exciting is with the underlying topographic variables such as water depth, seabed slope, and so on. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you in a movie in a second. I'll just take you through the, the model uh, that Jackie developed from her PhD. Now that it's been overlaying onto the um, three-dimensional model of the topography of the Bay of Biscay to really help you see what this means for species distribution. Before we start, to give you some uh, points of reference, this is England here, this is Portsmouth here, this is France, this is uh, Spain down here. The light red line is the, uh, the track of the ferry, typical track of the ferry along the surface. The darker red line is its shadow along the seabed. The dark dots are the shadows of uh, where the species or uh, Cuvier's beetles are seen at the surface. In terms of the model predictions, blue is poor habitat where the species is unlikely to occur whereas uh, yellows and reds are where the best habitat for them where they're most likely to occur. And by doing this we can take the knowledge of what we record along the ferry route and apply it to the entire Bay of Biscay to be able to predict where the animals are going to be, where the key areas are for them uh, to conserve them. I'm just going to start the movie no uh, now. And what we'll do is going to be flying south along the Bay of Biscay and we can see that as we drop into the Bay of Biscay, the deeper waters of the Bay of Biscay off the sh shelf, we can clearly see that the best habitat for the animals isn't in the shelf waters or in the deep abyssal areas, but it's very much concentrated along the shelf edges to the north and to the south. And this really gives uh, an, an understanding of how the beak tools are using the habitat that we cannot get in any other way. And we can say, okay, these are the areas that are critical for, critical for beak twills, for cubius beak twills, and these are the areas where we really need to concentrate our conservation activities. So that's the movie just coming to an end there. Um, and once it does, what we'll do is we'll move on to the next uh, bit of work I'm going to talk about today. And this is the change in currents of common and white beaked dolphin. The survey set up by BDRP and more recently Marine Life has encouraged other groups to also start conducting similar surveys. These often use passenger ferries as well and use similar method, a similar method to the one originally developed by Marine Life or BDRP as it was then for surveys on such vessels. This allows all these groups to work together as the Atlantic Research Coalition, which was established by Marine Life, to look at what's happening over a wide area. Here, two examples of this will be presented, one for a species doing well, and one for a species doing poorly. The two species I'm going to talk about are the white big dolphin, which is a cold temperate subpolar species, very much restricted to shelf waters. We don't see it in deep waters at all and the common dolphin, which is a warm temperate tropical species that we see in the shelf areas but also out in the deeper waters. If we look at common dolphin first, uh, and this is looking at the, just the trends and occurrence at a number of different locations around the UK. I know this looks a bit complicated at first, but bear with me and I'll show you exactly what this means. So in each of these little graphs refers to an individual region that's surveyed, for example, the um, Southwest English Channel, and this is just how the occurrence has changed there over the period of time along the bottom, running from about the mid-90s to the end of the 2000s. And the key things to take away from this are as follows. In some areas, the common dolphin have been consistently common. In other areas, they've been rapidly increased over time. They've gone from not really occurring there at all to occurring there in quite large numbers over a very short space of time, maybe three or four years. We've got areas of sporadic occurrence um, where they're seen but not seen very often. And we've got areas where they're consistently absent. And really the key thing is this, the two areas where they're increasing. And what we think this means is that common dolphin are expanding their distribution from once, once where they were most commonly found up into areas like the Sea of Hebrides, the Minch, and even over into the, um, the outer Murray Firth. This represents an expansion distribution and tells us that common dolphin are doing quite well in this region. In contrast, if we look at, at white big dolphin, we get a very different picture. These are slightly different maps. I'll just take you through what they mean here. Basically, the, they're the territorial waters of the UK are divided into different regions. And they've been given different colours based on, on the occurrence of white big dolphins within them. White means that they're rare or absent in a, a region. Light grey means that they're present but only un they're uncommon or localised in occurrence, whereas the dark grey 
it means that they're common or widespread in that region. You can or ignore the numbers there just to tell uh, as a, um, a marker for which region is which. If we look at the situation before 2000, we find that uh, white big dolphin were widespread throughout much of the North Sea, also the west of Scotland, and were present but uncommon throughout most of the other waters around the UK and Ireland. However, when we take the data collected by marine life and collected by other organisations uh, throughout these waters, we see that after 2000 there's been a very much change in distribution. The species has pretty much disappeared from Irish waters, from the southern England, it's become much, much rarer in eastern Scotland. And it's really now only common around the Northern Isles of Orkney and Shetland and then in the, nor in the North Sea. This re uh, represents quite a dramatic decline in their species status um, over a relatively short period of time, maybe a decade at the most. This is where projects that marine life is now conducting in areas like Lyme Bay, but also of Northwest England, um, into white big dolphins are really quite important, really help us find out what is going on, why these are occurring and how we can best act to help conserve species that are declining in this way. And this leads me on to the third section, of the uh, third thing I'm going to talk about, which is looking at the effects of climate change on cetaceans. In particular, to do this we've been taking the data from marine life and just for the beaked whales we built models for the uh, Bay of Biscay to look at where they might be occurring. We've been taking the data for all the different species from um, the marine, marine life collects combining it with data from a couple of other groups and using it to predict where species are likely to occur based on things like water depth and also on, on more importantly on sea temperature. And by doing this we can get an understanding of where the species occurs at any given time given the temperature at that time. This is the, a predicted distribution for um, common dolphin. And really the key thing you've got to take away from this is they're going to be uncommon or absent, sorry rare absent in the areas that are black or they're going to be common um, and widespread in the areas that are pink, red or dark red. And it's all fine to be able to have a map like this. But what we need to do is ensure that this accurately catches the, the distribution of the animal and how it changes over time in response to climate change or change in water temperature. And we can see if we look back in time in the North Sea, this is the red area here, the red box, we see that the temperatures were actually much cooler back in the um, 70s and 60s than they are now, but were warmer than that in the 1930s and 40s. And what we can do is take our models that we've built um, and predict backwards in time what the model says to the distribution would have been in the past and compare that to what actually changed in terms of um, distribution. And what we can see if we look in this graph here is we get a very strong relationship between our predicted occurrence in red from the model or modeled occurrence and the actual changes of occurrence in the blue. And this gives us faith that our models are actually capturing how the species distribution changes in relation to changes in water temperature that are associated with climate change. And we can then take this information and make predictions about the future distribution. And as you'll see from these two maps, common dolphin on the right and now white big dolphin, sorry, common dolphin on the left, white big dolphin on the right. Over the next hundred years, because of the way the temperatures are going to increase, common dolphin are going to greatly expand the distribution, but white big dolphin are pretty much going to disappear as a species we've found um, around the UK and Ireland. I'll just run that sequence again, starting um, in the next decade or so, and running forward up until the end of the 20th century, uh, sorry, 21st century. And we can see by about the middle of that, white big dolphins are pretty much going to disappear from the waters around the UK. And the reason they're going to disappear rather than just shift northwards is there's basically no none of the shallow shelf water they like north of Shetland. So there's nowhere for them to go, they're going to disappear and, and um, unfortunately we will lose this entire population. So, in conclusion, without the work of marine life, it's many volunteers and surveyors and other groups, uh, and the other groups it works with and that it has inspired, we would know much less about the cetaceans than the seas around us. This information is important if we're able to if we're to be able to con uh, implement conservation strategies at work. We also need to understand how climate change will affect species in the future in order to ensure that these conservation strategies will keep working. Um, and data, data collected by marine, marine life is playing a key role both in understanding species.
biology and ecology, but also in understanding how climate change is affecting cetaceans in our waters, and in developing models to help us understand what is likely to happen in the future. And in this way, um, marine life, its volunteers, the people collecting the data, are having a real impact on conservation of cetaceans in the UK and indeed throughout northwestern Europe. So thank you very much for listening. Apologies again for not being there, but I hope you've enjoyed the talks you've heard here uh, today, uh, and I'll bid you goodbye. Thank you.